record on this computer. Share screen. That one. Okay, so uh, what I thought I'd do was um, talk a little bit about some of those areas that I think we didn't touch on so much. I'm sure I mentioned it in the data science. And I'd love to hear your experiences because I know some of you have even like worked as data scientists. And if I'm, what I'm saying is not true, then let me know. <laughs> okay, so uh, I've, I've called it projects and data governance because there'll be some projects in here. But we'll start by just, reiterating some of the things I said in the advanced data science lecture. So you, you remember this three types of lies, lies, damn lies, and big data is the notion here that we're in this sort of really interesting era, which is, I kind of think that the driving phenomena behind, I mean, everyone wants to talk about AI, but the reality is the thing we've got is this interconnected world with a lot more data available. And it's that data that is sort of driving new technologies. And if you remember in the advanced data science lecture, I sort of talked about, well, this has happened actually sort of before in statistics. And there was this whole era when statisticians, well, people were counting things and drawing conclusions from counting those things and then misrepresenting the answer of those conclusions. And that was put right by mathematical statistics, this field. Probably something I didn't spend as much time as I could have done on is, you know, this is also the origin of eugenics, which shows how dangerous this is when you think you've discovered some access to truth, which in some sense they had the tendency for people to start saying, well, we should impose our truth on society. And we're definitely seeing that with like the notion of techno solutionism, just what's going on. It's like, oh, now we all have to be in a metaverse. We all have to do all these things. Um, and, you know, humans keep making the same mistakes and you know maybe it's you know that the consequences of those mistakes your little truth initially your little truth sounds okay an interesting intellectual idea but when deployed at scale has a horrific consequences so we have to worry about that as well but we're also missing these mathematical techniques which you know i've been sort of talking about to understand what's going on in data science and then you'll remember me talking about this notion of embodiment factors why is this a problem because at hum as humans, we have this very low bandwidth capacity to absorb information. And so we put an enormous amount of computation into the information as we absorb it. So when I'm talking to you, we have these conversations. I have to have a sense of who you are and, and what I say is dependent on that model I have for you because I'm a human. I have a good sense in some sense of what other humans think. And so I choose the concepts I use to fit within the context that you understand. And that's how I communicate the idea. And that means often we talk in narratives or we talk in things that humans are quite comfortable absorbing. And this is one of the really major challenges of when we're presenting data. How do you convert such data into a plausible narrative? And um, you'll remember Carl Henrik's lecture was on visualization and that's one way to go, right? So this complexity of the interaction with data which manifests as when we interact with the machine that we don't really have a good sensible model of the way the machine is operating with data. And the whole point in the embodiments factors idea was to sort of give you the sense of it's doing something very different, right? It has this very, very high bandwidth capability. We talked about the notion of bandwidth in the Jeff Bezos salary earning, you know, its bandwidth, our bandwidth is equivalent to earning $2,000 a month. Its bandwidth is equivalent to earning Jeff Bezos's entire wealth every two or three months, right? So it's just in this zone in terms of the speed with which it can acquire information that's well ahead of us. And that sort of motivates, I think, this, this picture of the world that is very close to me, that we've got this evolved relationship with information that we used to, if we go back to sort of Disraeli times, if we go back to the 19th century, people trying to use data in decision-making around governing. It's the relationship between the human and the data that the um, early math, early statistics was focused on. Whereas if we go to today, we've got this new interloper. I like the fact that it's an interloper and often it's an interpolator. Did you see that? 
interloper interpolate because it interpolates between data because machine learning is curve fitting. It's just a switch, two letters. Couldn't it? It's an interpol, it's an interloper and often an interpolator that is just giving us extending between data to sort of give these things. And then this is my view, like of, of the what's going on. This is why something's new. I mean, like classical statistics saying, well, you know, we've been doing this for ages. Yes, you have, and it's brilliant, and we love all your techniques. But something new is going on here, right? And a lot of what you see me teaching about is the consequences of that. So in ML and the physical world, we're like, oh, we can generate data, we can do simulations, we can put our physical understanding of the data of the world into the machine, and we can cause that to sort of generate data, right? So that's like data emerging from the computer. And in advanced data science, we're like, well, now we actually have this sort of system where we're interacting with the data and we're trying to sort of put the computer between us and the conclusions. And that enables us to leverage far more data than we would normally be able to. So that's why it's a really, really exciting time. And of course, you're in a very exciting place because you know the consequences of all this inference in the context of environmental risk are, are very important. So I think I we definitely would have done the Gartner hype cycle. You may have even seen me do it twice, where it's nice that we've got these technologies and everyone's getting sort of overexcited about what they'll do. Everyone wants to do AI plus something for their PhD. But it's not actually clear that we're delivering on the expectations of what that's going to do. But of course, you are going to deliver because you're thinking carefully about what the real world challenges are and how we can bring machine learning to interface with those. So uh, yeah, I would have done this as well, sort of just showing the, um, the different, different terms that can be applied to talk about this domain and, and how they come in and out uh, from Google Trends. So doing Google Trends searches on AI, big data, data mining, deep learning, you can see sort of these things fade in and out. I wonder if there's a theory as to why they fade out, you know, and then something else comes up. Is it because people want a solution to be here and they want it to be magical? And every time someone says we're going to solve this with data mining, and, and then it doesn't fix it quickly enough, then people stop saying data mining. I don't know. There's something to do with humans about, about that phenomena, isn't it? Okay, so when we got up to here, so let's just pause there and do some interaction. So that's kind of how I motivated then the advanced data science course. And what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in on, on number three, actually, for the next part. But let's just do, let's do, do questions and conversation. Um, I'm going to read and get a, uh, a chair. I don't know. Does that make sense? What do you think? Yes. Oliver. Yeah. Well, I was just gonna, yeah, I think you, you mentioned um, data science after stuff. Yeah, we'll go through a few different projects. And these first three, these, I wrote these down for a data science Africa talk where I was talking about the challenges of data science. And what I really like mm -hmm. that context is because when you're working in that environment, it's you're often looking at problems that aren't solved by existing infrastructure. Uh, there's a, there's a, I wrote a, an article about this, but I didn't originate this idea. My colleague, John Quinn, was who I heard it from, and he read about it in The Economist, so I don't know where it comes from. The notion that solving problems, you don't solve problems sort of by digging wells and toilets and building schools. You solve problems like with low-tech solutions. No tech problems can be solved by high tech solutions, is the notion, and uh, empowering people to do their own work with those things is what you're looking to do. So, you're very often looking at infrastructure that you would want in a society, and instead of being burdened with we've got expensive roads, railways, and whatever else, and fixed line telephone networks that we build that we use to solve these problems, as we tend to do in say the UK, all of a sudden you're like, okay, I don't have great roads or rail, but I do have an amazing mobile phone network. And then all of a sudden you become more advanced in your thinking than we typically are here, 
because if you want to do something around health records here, you're obviously going to fit in with an existing system. And if you're choosing to augment that system in some way, you sort of have to show a provable benefit over quite an effective existing system. Whereas quite often in the, in the African context, you may be providing something that's in the interest. You do have to be careful of these existing provisions, right? Not to sort of assume that you've done better. There's a lot of techno solutions in this space too, as well. And what does that mean that you can, so it's a horrible word, isn't it? Reimagining. You can reimagine like the, the way that you might want to do these things. And you end up talking in a much more advanced way about these technologies and one that's much more holistic in terms of considering all the parts than you do in most applications that come up here. And so I, I kind of feel I learned almost everything about this area that I've learned from seeing some of the projects. Other questions? Yeah, I know. They're probably the, have you heard about M-Pesa? M-Pesa, or sometimes it's called mobile money. So, so this was, I mean, banking systems are also quite poor for moving money and payments. And many, many people don't have bank accounts. And this is really problematic when you're trying to run a business, right? So what sort of happened was a mobile phone network emerged. One of the things that like you would find is a very typical setup is uh, people come from villages, but they may work in the city and they'll send money back to their village to support family. And you'll see that quite often. Um, like almost everyone, every sort of researcher we're gonna talk about will be in that position, probably. I'm not 100% sure, but quite likely. And families are quite, can be quite extended. Um, but to get the money back to the family, it's quite common to have to then drive back to the village, which given the poor quality of the roads is about a 10 hour drive. And what people started doing is to communicate with family that family had mobile phones. And if you go into like a village in, in kind of the middle of nowhere, certainly the villages I went to that feel like they're in the middle of nowhere, they're then by a major road, but not what would look like a major road uh, in the UK. Um, so there is mobile phone network there. You will go into the village and you'll see like, you know, mud brick houses, thatched roofs, and like in the city, you'll see a lot of adverts. You won't see any commercial sign apart from one, which will be a mobile phone supplier and a charging station. So people can charge and have mobile phone access within the village. And so that people say, well, rather than sending money, why don't I just send credit to your mobile phone, right? Because they're now to drive. And then people notice, the mobile phone companies notice that people were moving credit around on the mobile phones. And then they just invented this thing, mobile money, which is way more advanced than any of our payment solutions. And, you know, has been there for like 10 years. So almost all transactions within Uganda and Kenya, not Nigeria, I, I don't fully really understand why Nigeria, I think didn't pick up on it as much, are done by mobile money. And then this leads to a really interesting phenomenon called microfinancing. So you have setups and, and potentially an exploitative phenomenon as well, where um, let's say you run a store in town. Well, um, what was it called? A cash advance. I'll call it cash advance, but there's a float. Yeah. So, you know, the typical way you might run a business is you get a float to buy your goods in the morning and then you um, spend the float buying goods and then across the day you sell those goods and then you can pay back the float and you've got your profit, right? So people have set up microfinancing things for that. <laughs> Some interesting, I remember one talk which was about um, the success of the payback on these microfinancing schemes. Because then, you know, you could also say, well, this is potentially problematic. It could be also like longer payday loan sticks. So you, all of these things have got pros and cons. But what they were sort of showing, and I can't remember if it was an NGO or a bank or who it was that was running this one, was um, uh, the probability of the payback on the loan according to the time of day that the loan was given. And there's this really interesting phenomena that like, 
as you go later at night, the probability the loans pay back is low because people are asking for the loan because they're drinking, you know. And then there's this switch, like at four in the morning, it's like the worst possible time. No one ever pays back the loan at that or at 3.30 or something. But then at five in the morning, all the loans are paid back because the five in the morning is people who are using the loan for their business and doing their float for the day. So you get all these sort of weird things, which you could also see a consequential in society. And one of the biggest consequences, I can't remember their name, but um, is there, is anyone here follow UK soccer? Who sponsors Everton? I can't remember their name. It's a big, but it's a big Kenyan betting company. Because of course, one of the results of this is the market for betting in African countries now is enormous. Like on premiership football, because everyone now has the capability to bet very quickly. So yes, they've got more technically advanced than us, and they've also got all the sort of things that you would, would, would expect to follow that. And I think one of the challenges we face is, you know, trying to make sure that those things are also going in positive directions. Because of course, a betting company can expand very, very quickly because they make a lot of money, whereas a lot of the things we might be interested in expand less quickly because they may not make that money. Other questions around that? I think you have to be careful about, I mean, profit generating companies are immensely powerful mechanisms for developing, but there's this question of, is it exploitative? Because also the notion of stepping in and helping is highly problematic because often a lot of what people are doing is they're destroying opportunities for local people to come up with ideas. But yeah, of course, what you're saying is a problem as well. You get companies coming in, I mean, like, I don't think that betting thing is doing that much good for anyone. I mean, probably people are enjoying it in the moment, but you know, I'm not breaking on UK betting companies either. Yeah, so yeah, that's a problem. And you see that coming up a lot. And of course it comes up when a lot of money comes around something and then investors want return. And of course the local ecosystems around startups are quite fragile. I mean, they're not that great relative to the US in the UK, right? So you've got all these missing components that you really want a group of educated population who start coming up with the business ideas that solve local problems um, because they understand that it's a local problem. And then rather than that being done by an NGO or a charity, you want it to be something done by some 22 year old Ugandan who thinks this is a cool idea. But the ecosystem around them for funding them, for supporting those ideas is sort of also missing. And then you also see this tendency to project whatever the European way of doing that is onto their way, even by people who are Ugandan gone abroad, because there's this somehow sense that, that, that it's, it's a good idea. So yeah, that comes up all the time. I think the problem with it is like to sort of intervene and say it's going to happen in a specific case is quite hard. So my own approach, this personal approach to it is, if you work on education and supporting people of, with the things that they want to do, and or I don't even work on the education now, just helping to build an infrastructure for education, then it's down to individuals whether they choose to do that. Because imposing on someone, you're not allowed to build an exploitative company within your country is, is kind of quite hard to do anyway. And um, it's not really 
my business people will do with their education what they'll do obviously i don't want them to do that but you kind of to me a lot of it's about well what ecosystems can you create and i think that when we'll see we'll see some of the projects you'll see what they've already done in kampala around some of these ecosystems and because now the people who are mostly involved in these projects are also now involved in a not-for-profit called sunbird that is about um helping out with the data science solutions um, in problems where they're needed. Uh, I think I've seen a lot of the follow-up questions, um, like rather than from a perspective of data science solutions, I'm curious how you think about um, like the that sometimes I think there could be solutions for like data like a micro I think that most of the time I'm not navigating that choice. I'm just trying to do capability building. And so one of the things that we've started doing, and Maureen, I'll talk about her projects at the end. She's um, someone who started out as a data scientist, but has moved into the policy space. So we've always viewed it end to end that we need capabilities across the board. And that's going like right from the customer and then all the way to government. And with Maureen, she's the first DSA fellow. It's this new scheme we've launched. And if it hadn't been for the pandemic, she would have visited. But what we've worked with her on is um, on the sort of, and that's, actually that's something that I sort of noticed is a big difference between a lot of um, sort of evolved economies and the, um, the sort of economies we're talking about when it comes to governance. The, the gap that people don't notice isn't there is the large professional civil service, the thing that everyone likes to complain about here, right? Governments are run most of the time by a group of people who aren't elected. So, and it, actually the level at which they become elected varies country to country. So. Um, I think all the way down to, in the UK, a deputy director wouldn't be elected. And in the US, I think it maybe would be, or it's the level above that, a director. So these are people who are running government departments. But in the UK, it goes all the way up to um, director general is not elected. And they are civil servants. And their career is operating these departments. And that will spread, you know, from things like running the transport and deciding how to prioritize payment. They'll be doing the research, they'll present the information to ministers, all the way across the justice systems or the Office for National Statistics. So the level of competence you have in those organizations in a developed economy is massive, um, broadly because you have like quite a large educated population. Um, and government is partly that, and then it's partly the elected officials who are, um, you know, the, the civil service is subservient to, but it's also, um, so it's guided by, but by the same time, if you just, if it was just elected people running it, everything would be a mess because they keep changing their mind about what to do and they don't have enough time to focus on the boring stuff. They're focusing on whatever the people are worrying about in the country. So there's an amount of running and it, like Germany didn't stop working when it didn't have its government for this period of time. Belgium seems to never have a government when it continues to do stuff, right? Um, but in, in a lot of African countries, that's really missing. So you have people doing those jobs, but they're very under-resourced. And th when we sort of look at the government structure, the reason why you often get problems in terms of uh, leaders staying in a long time is the ecosystem around them to prevent that is not there. Like, it's not like we've got this long list of leaders in Europe and the US who leave their position quietly at the end of their term without a struggle. What the reality is, is we have a lot of institutions and ecosystems that encourage them to go. So most of that doesn't exist to the same extent. And this all feeds into this problem of what does policy mean? But then my approach is just to step back from that and sort of say, well, building capability in policy is a good thing. So building, building a, a cadre of people who understand data and understand how, the, how you explain data and present things for policy usage is a good thing. Actually, most UK academics will not understand how to do that, but we've been working with people who are familiar with the civil service um, to sort of mentor 
individuals in doing that. And the interesting thing in, in the policy in the African context is it will go beyond just the governmental organizations. It will also feed into things like the UN, non-governmental organizations, things like the Global Partnership for Sustainable uh, Development Goals, data or, or data for sustainable development goals. These sort of institutions that are there as part of the ecosystem that often don't have this interaction with uh, a sort of broad base of policy. But we'll see Maureen who's been doing that. And uh, it's so great because, I mean, she could, Maureen's really flowering and delivering this and doing things that she doesn't believe that she's capable of doing, like convening a workshop around um, uh, data sharing in the African context that she's extremely nervous about beforehand, but we know she's got it. And all you're doing is just standing there and saying, no, Maureen, you've got this, you got this. And then you watch her do the workshop and she totally has got it. And she now has the confidence to go ahead and potentially mentor someone else in doing that, as well as delivering the policy document. Because if you build those capabilities on the ground, you're just giving people confidence still. And, and these things aren't that hard. You just have to have done it once, you know, and, you have to, and there's a few pitfalls you have to avoid, right? Okay, shall I carry on a bit with the... Um... So you can see in some sense, we're focusing very much on, um, on, on the last of these today. Because, well, actually, I think it's where the consequences of what I said at the beginning. Yeah, this is important. It would be really nice if we could sort this. This, this paradox is that's the big data paradox. That was a real problem in the pandemic. But I really feel, and by the way, I didn't start by thinking I care so much about what it means to be human in some, I mean, I don't, I like being human. But really going through that as an attempt to explain um, publicly why AI is different from human intelligence. That, that's my explanation that I developed to get people out of sort of foolish thinking about singularities and terminators. It made me realize that that aspect to us, that frailty about us, that low bandwidth thing we have is really precious and fragile and really open to manipulation. I mean, that's kind of, I wrote about this in, in these Guardian articles six or seven years ago. And I think we've seen the consequences of that in um, you know, in elections, in fake news, in uh, in what's going on in social media, but I think that the um, you know this is we're getting to this sort of weird position. Society is becoming harder to monitor, and the individuals are becoming easier to monitor and and manipulate. So yeah, we've seen these sort of things. Actually, we talked about them before. So let's go on to um, I think the African context. So. I can't remember how much I talked about Data Science Africa in the, um, uh, in the uh, ADS lecture, but I just give you the sort of sense of the background. So it goes back to, actually I've always thought, personally I thought Africa was an interesting place, but the reason um, uh, I got into this is my colleague, John Quinn actually went to Uganda after his PhD and joined a university, Makerere University, and started teaching there. And I was kind of just intrigued by that. And we happened to be at the same workshop in Dagstuhl. And he was there with his PhD student, Ernest, who we'll, we'll also hear about. And Ernest has done a great talk about the deployment of some of these that we'll link to that you, I'd also urge you to watch. And they said, well, come over and we'll talk about research and you can do some teaching. So we did that. And then I also had a postdoc who was Kenyan and when it came to sort of talking about his future career goals and what he wanted to do afterwards, he said, well, he really wanted to go back to Kenya and, and teach in Kenya. And so he found this job in this place called Nyeri. And I, we'd already started doing this, this work in Kampala. And Kampala and Nyeri are within a 24 hour bus ride from each other. And I said to him, okay, well, what we'll do is um, when you've been there a couple of years, We'll come across and we'll do a workshop. We'll do some teaching, building on the Kampala experience. And he got together with John. So where are we talking about? We're talking about, this is Shira. He's in the area. John and uh, Ernest and Maureen and several other people are in Kampala. Um, we've got Dina down in Tanzania. Um, I don't know that. I, then it starts getting vaguer for me because actually this was, what we started with was, was Nyeri. Uh, so that's at June 2015. And we knew we were going to go to Kampala next. And we went to Kampala a year later, June 2016. And 
these, this is a, you can do this in 24 hours on a bus. And we really wanted a third leg because political instabilities can mean that at any point these universities can shut down. And indeed it sort of slightly happened when I was first visiting, it didn't fully happen. And, and um, John was explaining to me that if the university had fully shut down, uh, the students go on strike, there's tear gas, things going on in Kampala, the, the lecturers would have flown to uh, Rwanda. Which I can't quite see all the people somewhere down here, right? And started teaching in Kigali. Like, that really made an impression on me. And so you sort of feel like, oh, well, so you want a situation where the students can also decide, oh, well, this is a bit stressful. I'll go somewhere nearby and that they can travel. So we wanted like, and then having three countries was really the key. So, so we, we, these were the two initial institutions. And then Dina, who was in Arusha, Dina is absolutely wonderful. She came to Kampala. We met her for the first time. She said, I would love to do this in Arusha. This is the um, African Institute of Science and Technology, Nelson Mandela, uh, African Institute of Science and Technology. Um, and actually, that, that's the most amazing location. It's, um, it's close to the Serengeti and Kilimanjaro. So it's more of a, it's the, these aren't really tourist towns. That is kind of quite close to a tourist town. But Dina came and said, can we do this next year in Tanzania? And we're like, oh, brilliant. Yeah, we were exactly looking for like a third country. And again, like all the Ugandans came across the border. The bus driver had forgotten to bring a passport and somehow they had to, um, to the meeting. So we had this sort of core of three um, institutions where we were starting to build capabilities. And what happened, I remember very clearly in Tanzania, we had someone who'd come from Congo, we come from the side of Congo. So Congo, you know, they drew these lines about where the countries are. And um, I guess this is Congo here. So this must be Rwanda here. And this, I don't know, this, it's quite difficult. So Kinshasa, who's the capital, is on this side. And then it's actually really disconnected from this side. So he'd taken some three-day bus to, or some flight to get to Kigali. He'd come around the whole of Lake. So, I mean, like the journey was days and days. And we weren't really looking to expand, but we were getting people coming from West Africa. So um, Charles Saidu was there in Tanzania from Abuja. And he said, oh, I really want to be able to do this in Abuja, in the African University for Science and Technology. Can we go to Abuja? And so we said, OK, well, let's spin up into West Africa as well. So you can see the first three meetings went around here once and then jumped to Abuja. Addis Ababa, just because the number of people are coming. When you're in Addis Ababa, we had attendees from Sudan, we had attendees from all these regions here. Anywhere that you could travel within two or three days on a bus are coming, but you're also, there was always a story of like some five day journey where people are coming to sort of pick up these techniques. The most beautiful thing about it that I really, really came home in Addis Ababa was, um, oh, I can't forgot her name for a moment. She's a Kenyan, um, oh, a terrible shell. Shell, who's uh, Shell Karaoke from Kenya, which is a very larger than life individual. And we're all sitting together sharing the um, sort of moment after the conference. She made everyone go around and say what they enjoy about the meeting. And now you've got people, you've got Charles was there from Abuja, you've got, uh, we're in Ethiopia, so there's a number of Ethiopians, you've got Ugandans, you've got Kenyans. What was really emerging for that meeting, and they sort of said that this is something they get from DSA that they don't get from anywhere else, is that shared understanding of what the actual problems are. And it was really odd for me because I could quite quickly see where the actual problems were and where I was researching them. But many of these researchers are also submitting work into Europe, into um, uh, UK and US, wherever conferences in these places. Of course, when they go there, they're told this is the main problem in our area. And so they end up working on that, but that has very little to do with the actual main problem that they're facing. And the thing I would argue is that the main problem that they're facing often turns out to be much more fundamental and much more interesting than anything anyone is talking about in a European conference. And you know, the sort of dualities you find is, well, so Addis, Ethiopia, I mean, has a set of problems, some of which are around the fact that there is, you know, it would never, sort of successfully colonized. So it has its own languages and structures. Whereas um, Nigeria was colonized by the Niger company and became Unilever and then Britain, you know. And so it's got this imposed English language on it. Um, so there's a lot of pigeon speaking in Nigeria and a lot of different 
tribal areas, which are very different cultures that have just been pushed into this one situation. Whereas Ethiopia is it's a lot less of that because it was never had an imposed structure, but it does have this thing where English is very rarely spoken, like on the street. Whereas in Nigeria, it's kind of constantly spoken in, in some sort of simplified form. But you, and I did an interview on talking machines that you can listen to where I had Charles and Michael, um, who Charles who led the meeting in uh, Abuja and uh, Michael who led the meeting in Addis Ababa, just talking about these shared sort of problems and what the experiences are. And for me, that's kind of what motivates every direction I care about on research at the moment. And they say, okay, not the stuff we do with Formula One teams. But, I would say we paid for all these early meetings from the consulting money from the F1 team that we were working with. So that's so none of this was funded by like an NGO or anything like that. And that actually I think turned out to be really, really important because we were doing it on so little money that it's very, very sustainable, right? It's not requiring tens of thousands of pounds to deliver these things. And in fact, it started getting bad when. When people found out about us and started wanting to give us money, then all of a sudden the universities are wanting to charge a fortune to host the conference. But if you establish that as a sort of the way the things are running, and it's great, fine, I don't mind the universities are getting some money. But then when that money disappears, you know, you want something that people can just do, right, um, in whatever way they can. So this is the most recent one. This was virtual. Um, Acro was live. Um, but this was virtual, and we had also had a, a second, the June 2021 in Kampala was virtual. And it's really, in a, you can run these virtual conferences, they're all being done by Zoom because mobile, mobile networks are good. So if you want to sort of read about the philosophy at the time, this is this is an article from 2015, how African benefit from the data revolution, locally driven data projects across the continent can enable infrastructure to bring about economic change. And this is Shira teaching um, in uh, Nyeri at the first ever school. Okay, so a little example of the, the project. So this is um, Martin uh, Mugagizi, who's um, still, he's very active now. He leads the Ugandan chapter of DSA, but at this time he was a PhD student. He was working with my PhD student, Ricardo and John, who's John, who I mentioned, on this first project example that we tried. And the idea was um, uh, to produce, uh, use Gaussian process models for augmenting malaria incidents. I wonder if that site still exists, you see, probably. So in the end it, um, oh, here we go, yeah. Yeah, so this is, this is the site where you can um, monitor the results of this project. And, and this turned out to be the main contribution. We did a load of fancy machine learning, and I'll explain why that fancy machine learning wasn't very good. Um, or, well, because we um, we did it's that classic thing. We ended up um, not looking at the data um, because we couldn't because it was. Uh, so now I need to uh, go back. Sorry about that. Uh, So this, this, the idea of this project was quite a sophisticated idea, and I sort of want to clarify how it ended up being useful, but in a very simpler way. So the idea was, can we help predict malaria incidents? So malaria is a devastating disease and one of the most common diseases in terms of um, the number of people that get it and very you know, high death rates. Uh, can we use side information like altitude and weather to help predict malaria? So this is um, an image of Uganda, the capital Kampala is all around, around here. It's certainly on, this is Lake Victoria. Um, in this, this side, you're starting to get down to Congo. And, um, this is, this side's Kenya. Um, and you've got these different districts. And the different districts have reports about how much malaria they think is in their region. They come from health centers that are in the district. So, oh, by out of this region, you, you know, Ebola is the historical place where Ebola would come. So you actually have these very sophisticated health monitoring services for determining when Ebola's arisen. Really sophisticated. I mean, they, they go in with these teams and lock down villages uh, in pandemic response. We met some people from there, uh, based at the Uganda Viral Research Institute. 
But over across the whole country, there's an information system for sharing information about disease. And our idea was to take that information. So here's, here's one district. And then you can sort of look at the sort of disease levels from that district. So this is Tororo, uh, Tororo, sorry, did I get that pronunciation right? Tororo district, there's, there's this information we have from a so-called Sentinel site. So this is a WHO site where they explicitly measure the malaria by looking at the blood and doing the full diagnosis. So malaria is quite difficult to diagnose because it, it could be typhoid and malaria look similar and they're often misdiagnosed one for the other. And the only way you can really do the diagnosis is you look at a blood sample and then you've got to see the parasite. But that turns out to be quite a skilled job. People are looking, John's done work on that. So this is um, malaria patients from this Sentinel highly curated data. And our notion was we could take this age list data, which is like just the reports, what health centers are saying in that district and work out the correlation between this and this, and then combine it with things like satellite rain, weather station temperature, blah, 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 so that we could try and reconstruct a Sentinel-like measure for any district in uh, Uganda. That was our quite sophisticated idea. It does sound like a fancy project, doesn't it? Um, so what happened, okay, so, Okay, yeah, and it all comes, this is the, that first school I mentioned. So there's Ricardo, there's John, there's, there's, there's me, there's Martin. Um, see Ernest, it's, I'm a bit too close. I think that's Ernest there. Um, a bunch of people at this school go on to teach the later schools. Um, so this, but this is before it was a data science school. We taught, we taught the Galaxy Process School. Um, but, what did we actually end up doing? Well, how did things go wrong? Well, it turned out that the HMIS data that we were getting, so, so Ricardo and Martin did a load of work together to, to get this system up and running. Martin, including looking at like vegetation data off satellites, doing the pre-processing of that to get that ready so that we could correlate with vegetation, trying to pull in information about weather, the amount of data processing work that was done to get this project off the ground. And then when we tried to, tried to do it, well, it didn't work. We couldn't get these correlations. They didn't work. So that the, somehow our idea was wrong, or so we felt. Now, Ricardo wrote up his thesis, submitted past his thesis, even though it was a sort of negative result. And then he had some spare time before he took on his job. So he, he, he flew to um, Kampala and he worked directly at UN Global Pulse um, on health data and ended up building that project that the, I quickly linked to on the webpage there. And he found out, he could then look at the disaggregated data because all we have from HMIS, all they release is aggregated data. And when he looked at the disaggregated data, he found out that um, there was missing data from each of these places. And when they combined, but the, the thing we were seeing was summed without dealing with the missing data. So basically they just put a zero when the data was missing. So when a, dis, when a, when a health center didn't report, that wasn't being dealt with. And then he spent the few months there fixing that for the Uganda health system, just fitting Gaussian processes to fill in the missing values. And that is now a fundamental part of their disease monitoring system. By way of oh, another technological leap area, well ahead of us in terms of monitoring of human disease or where we were at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. You talk to anyone who was working on tropical diseases, epidemiology, you know, and it was way easier to get information about disease spread in Uganda. So, you know, think, oh, well, that's bad that they were doing that. Oh yeah, but they were well ahead of where we were and you should see some of the crap things that we were doing. Anyway, so Ricardo's idea turned into this sort of early warning system where you just fit a Gaussian process to the disease levels with the um, error removed. And then you start, you just visualize in terms of these four quadrants. Green is below the long-term trend. So you use a covariance function with a short-term and a long-term trend. Green is below the long-term trend, which is here in red. So blue is the short-term trend. Below the long-term trend and getting better. Yellow is below the long-term trend, but getting worse. Red is above the long-term trend and getting worse. And orange is above the long-term trend, but getting better. So once you've got something like that, little traffic light system, you can start visualizing what's going on in your country in quite simple ways, right? And these type of visualizations exactly what 
policymakers, people in the Department of Health need to understand. They've got way better visualizations than this. This is just something that Ricardo did that I thought was very cool. I don't think it was actually deployed, uh, but their visualizations have things like where the disease is now, and then they use mobile phone data to um, see the cell to cell movement where people are moving. So they just see where the disease is now, and then they just have these sort of do -do 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 people are moving from here to here so they can try and predict where the disease is going very very cool very simple other projects that i'll just briefly mention this is ernest who was right there at the beginning and he said that he was ai google so it's interesting google then set up an ai thing in accra and employed a bunch of the people we trained and but a lot of them have now gone back to just working in macare so they gained some experience there as well and ernest is one of them very very cool project on mobile monitoring of crop disease so this is like going out into the field and you can see an entire talk by Ernest on this that was given a deep learning course last year that's online this is a video of him where he'll talk about all the issues it's uh, on this cassava which is a, a crop and, and one of the great things is Ernest is like you know in Kampala and a city dweller and you know when you hear him talk he'll talk about you know their misunderstanding of farmers life and what was going on in the agriculture and how it's not enough for a Ugandan in the city to sort of project onto what a Ugandan farmer needs so you really have to go right down to the roots as it were Ernest I'm sorry Martin who I just described spatial temporal models biosurveillance so that's the sort of you know stemming from the work he did with us I love this project this is Maureen I mean, other people are involved. I'm just picturing one of these. So this is a, a community radio machine readable project. So deploying Raspberry Pis across Uganda picks up on, there's lots of community radio stations where they do phone in. And the Raspberry Pi has a radio pickup. And then they do so-called wake word detection around words like hospital or flood or disease. And then they record the segment. Um, and wake word detection is already hard because people will be speaking Ugandan or local tribal languages or uh, you know, quite, uh, or the Ugandan variant of English. Um, and then they transcribe these things and hear what someone was saying. And it's all part for the UN. And it's part of trying to understand when there's an emerging problem. It's very hard to monitor what's going on, particularly for the UN. You can, if you go to this site, you can actually hear the things people say on these radio phone-in stations uh, where, and, and the, one of the stories that always stuck with me, it was about a hospital where at the hospital, um, it was really dirty and they made the patients sweep the, uh, clean the hospital, right? So there's a bunch of patients coming into the hospital and the story was that the, they said to the patients, you have to clean the hospital now. So all the ill people, you know, you, it's, it's, it's a very actually, emotive site to listen to. So that's another project that, that they work. Kudu, this is about um, within the Africa, within the Ugandan economy, um, matching the sales of um, goods such as plantain bananas or um, cassava to a market before driving to the market. So you, you've got a truckload of plantain bananas, right? Um, Matuke, I think it's the, I always get the pronunciation wrong, but they call them there. You want to know, should I, where can I get the best price? I've got three cities I could drive to. You, you use a mobile phone app to auction your bananas before you travel. And this is really, really interesting one that was very successful while it was running. I don't think that they've got the sustainability right on it yet. And, you know, you would be having a private company doing this in a sustainable way is better than having an NGO trying to fund this happening as long as they're not exploitative. That's the sort of thing that you want to emerge, but really inspiring project. Safe bodder. So bodders, bodder bodders are, um, are what they're called in Nigeria, but in Uganda they're called bodder bodders, motorbike taxis. So these are just sort of young, normally men that sit on the street. They drive these motorbikes and you can pay them to take you somewhere. It's a good way to get around town because of traffic. Well, this is like a, a whole thing with an Uber service for bodders. Um, and uh, the idea is that you get a helmet, right? So that's you don't get a helmet on normal bodders. You know you're going to get a helmet, and that the bodder driver is wearing a sort of high visibility dress uh, shirt. I have seen them in Kampala. They don't look that tidy and neat uh, in practice. But yeah, you know, you can see how that's just a really interesting, cool local need business that, if run in the right way, is going to bring benefits to a lot of people. Um, yeah. So. The next thing, just because I probably spent too long chatting before, but just to say a little bit about that policy 
thing. So this is Maureen, and she's just done this policy fellowship. This is Victor Ohurugu, who's from the um, uh, Data for Sustainable Development Goals organization. He is so clued up on data. Like, if you want to hear anyone talk about, he's the first person I heard talk about data who just covered all the issues really so clearly and coherently. And so with Jess, who's at Cambridge and is a policy expert, we got together to sort of look at what happened with data sharing in the COVID-19 pandemic as a policy exercise for Maureen as part of her fellowship. So Maureen's been doing work on that. She's sent out surveys and they ended up writing this blog post. So in, in, in the policy work, you do a lot of like, you can put out blog posts to get ideas more socialized. So you can read this blog post about what they wrote. Um, and I think the Data Science Africa blog isn't public yet, but that's kind of, we're setting it up to have this policy element to it. Um, so this is trying to be something that, you know, the idea here is you've done some policy work, you want that to be accessible. So you end up setting a blog so that people who want to look at data sharing can find out what your conclusions were. And she did that earlier on after sending out a survey and doing some interviews around what the experiences people were getting around data sharing. And then she summarized that at a workshop and I'm just giving you some slides um, from that workshop where she's talking about where people are saying that the data sharing was useful um, in terms of the feedback she was getting on the surveys. So like, for example, health infrastructure and staffing. And these are just a couple of slides she presented at that workshop. And these were the sort of summary areas for action. So she convened that and she convened a round table where a number of the actors were there and they spoke to these things. And that's now being written up to a new policy document that she's working on at the moment. And so that's how it feeds into how you want to make sure that the voices of these people that have done these projects and know the problems on the ground are being fed back into, in the African context, it's not just the governments, but the non-governmental organizations as well. Okay, so the last thing I was gonna talk about if I had time was data trusts, um, but I've, I've spent more than enough time talking about that. And we can just talk about, ask any further questions on this. So I've sort of shown you the diversity of those projects and, and the sort of things um, that we were doing there. And I'll probably just stop recording now and see what other questions or thoughts you have on uh, 